He's Howard Ibach, a former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And he's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist with 28 years of experience. Together, Henry and I are the Brief Brothers. We love talking about advertising, creative briefs, and briefing. Henry, we've got a fascinating guest today. His name is Ross Patrick. He is the creative lead and director of advertising for the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. He's teaching a course called AI for Advertising. It's a fascinating discussion. Let's join it right now. Okay, Henry, we're back with another episode. Today, we're joined by my new buddy, Ross Patrick. He's calling in from the West Coast. He's actually out here in the West Coast with me. I think you're in Marin County. Is that right? Yeah, I'm in San Francisco. But San yeah, Francisco. Uh, he reached out to me through my connection. on. I have a TikTok page called Brief Bites, where I talk about bits, bits of advice on writing a brief. And he reached out to me, and we had a great conversation. And I said, you need to come on to our show and talk about what you're doing. Um, he is the creative lead and director of advertising for the Academy of Art University in San Francisco, where he teaches a course called AI for Advertising. Now, if that doesn't set off some alarm bells in our industry, I don't know what will, right? Uh, but it's it's fascinating what he's doing. Uh, so first of all, Ross, thank you for joining Henry and me on The Brief Brothers. We're delighted to have you. Cool. Thank you for having me. Um, I, I do think it's pretty funny that we met on TikTok because I initially was teaching a class, a TikTok class at the Academy. That's sort of how I got started. And then AI came along and I switched gears and said, hey, why not teach AI? Well, you know, I've been on TikTok for like two weeks, so I'm pretty new to it myself. And it's like, you know, you can't, I, I, you, old dogs can learn new tricks, right? Yeah. So what what really is fascinating from my perspective about what you do is you are an agency veteran, 30 plus years of experience leading creative departments um, as an art director. And now you've transitioned into teaching uh, and you're teaching using AI as a way to teach advertising. So I want we definitely want to hear about what you're doing there. But first, let's just get a sense of how you got started. What drew you to advertising? Uh, give us a little sense of your trajectory as a career, and then we'll talk about what you're what you're doing now as an educator. Yeah, so um, uh, you know, I, I have a traditional art background. Um, I went to Gonzaga University and I studied painting, and I went to Italy and I thought I was going to be a painter. And then someone turned my head around and said, "You should go to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, and you should be in advertising." And I. I I was like, I'd never even thought that was a career, but I went there and um, I really, really, you know, got switched on with, with what advertising is, but I also fell in love with graphic design and the whole creative spectrum of things you can do from just being a creative. And uh, my first job out of Art Center was I got hired at Nike as a designer. And, um, but my, I, I really, once I got there, I was kind of full spectrum uh, my first thing I had to do was fly to New York and do a photo shoot um, with Arthur Elgore, who's one of the sort of godfathers of, of fashion photography. And I was working with some of the folks at Wyden Kennedy. I had some friends that I graduated with that went to Wyden, but I, I was at Nike in-house. And But it was great because there was really no nobody sort of holding my hand. I was just off and running, doing the shoots, um, shooting with big time photographers like Peggy Sirota. And, you know, we, we were Nike. We, we could, we could get those kinds of talent, uh, to do our shoots and whatnot. So I was really taking on that role of art director, designer. I was working with copywriters and I'd never worked with a copywriter before. And I, I love that, that whole relationship where, you know, you're, you're kind of sitting in the same cubicle, you're a team, everything has, you know, sort of a relationship. And after that, uh, I went on to be a, a creative director at Capitol Records, and I had writers that worked for me there. Uh, and, and, you know, they worked for me, but we were like partners. You know, that was sort of the way that agencies worked, and that's how we worked. We conceived ads. We did a whole bunch of work there. And then I started freelancing just on the side with my writing partner, and we were doing work for Starbucks and some other campaigns. And I really set my sight to work at Chiat Day, because that's what I... I was like, okay, I'm ready for the bigs. And I didn't quite work out, but years later, I did get a chance to get over to Deutsche LA. And I went in through the design door, not the typical sort of like ad door. And I ended up becoming the head of their design department. Uh, I was, a, I 
ended my time there as a senior vice president of design, but I was working with all the, all the creators there. And um, a lot of the top creatives who ended up going on to be pretty well known um, in the business were working in my group writing. We were doing a lot of retail work uh, for Mitsubishi Motors and Direct TV, and it all kind of was working out great. Um, later on, after uh, I left Deutsch, I, I had formed my own agency, but I ended up at uh, in-house at the Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf as the global creative director. And I was working with some former Deutsch colleagues, and it was great. But uh, they got bought by private equity, and I got a chance to move up here to the Bay Area to run a traditional design firm called DDW, but I, I got a really great opportunity to partner up with a gentleman named Mike Geft, who had been an ad agency veteran here in the Bay Area for, for also a couple of decades. And he had been at Deutsche LA, and he and I started turning DDW into a full service agency. And a bunch of uh, our Deutsche LA colleagues were up here in the Bay Area, all kind of in Marin, and we started bringing them in as writers and strategists. And, you know, it felt like we had sort of the golden ticket. And then COVID came along and sort of spanked that whole thing down. In fact, the night that Gavin Newsom closed the state of California um, was the night of the, the San Francisco Addy Awards. And uh, myself and Jason Elm and Mike Geft and a few of our other colleagues, we were on our way down to go accept our awards. And I was so excited to get up there on stage in front of Goodby and get my award, and, you know, sort of go, yeah, I've arrived in San Francisco. I, I figured it out. And then that ended. <laughs> and um, but but actually we, we had like 19 television commercials in production right as COVID hit. And so we, we thought, OK, it's going to still go. But then as things went along, I, I sort of branched off into my own agency called Extra Bold. And I was doing TikToks for, for uh, one of my former clients and they, they wanted to get on TikTok and they said, you know, can you help us? And then that, that actually landed me at the Academy of Art University as sort of the TikTok guy. And then this AI thing came along and I didn't ask for permission. I just, I just said, I'm going to teach this. This is maybe a tool that can help these students. And, you know, here's the thing. We have a lot of international students who, who don't have English as their first language. And so teaching writing and art direction and all these components was, was pretty tricky. But with, with, when you have like chat GPT as your sort of grammar teacher, your structural content teacher, and an ability to, you know, fix spellings and, and structures, it was great. And then an interesting thing happened. It, it's that you can train it and teach it all the ad tricks that, that people have, like, you know, let's let's do grammatically incorrect. Let's let's do um, got milk. That's not grammatically correct. Let's try writing in that in these sort of different ways. And for me, it was just fun. It was the gamification of this business that we're in. And the other thing that I noticed was that their strategies were were flawed. I was teaching a portfolio class, going, "Wow, the strategy's not right. Maybe ChatGPT can rewrite your strategy with a little bit of me sprinkling in some some insights." And then we started like getting into creative briefs and getting into like writing, writing, creative writing. And, and here we are uh, two years later. And um, yeah, that's, that, that's really the story. So who are some of your students? This class called AI for advertising, who, who makes up your, 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 your classroom? Like in this current um, semester, I've got 22 students in the class. I've got, Students from India, China, Korea, South Korea. Um, uh, there's actually a, a fair amount of American students. There's some Swedish students in there. Um, I, I mean, it's really diverse, and 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 so you you get a really eclectic mix, um, which I love. I love all the different sort of inputs and opinions, and maybe maybe there's a little bit of uh, lacking in pop culture for some of the American things that we all know. Like if I make a a movie reference to like Animal House, you know, sometimes I just get blank, blank stares. Or even if I make a more modern reference to- I was going to say, that's an age thing too. That's yeah, not just yeah. a cultural yeah, thing. Yeah, I know, I know. But but I do I do try to reference a little bit. But, but I do realize if I'm making like a 90s reference, a lot of them are like, uh-uh, we weren't born yet. So Now, some of, the, some of these students are not necessarily advertising students either, are they? 
No. So we did a thing where we knew that AI was a hot sort of buzzword and we opened it up so that I've got fashion design students. I've got architects. I've got, you know, industrial design. I've got UI UX students. It's really diverse. And the thing there was you're, yeah, you're basically talking to people that don't really know what advertising is. They, they don't know the mechanisms. They don't know how it works. So I, it's, a, it's a big hill to climb. And, and, you know, I was telling you uh, about how I'm using chat GPT as a, you know, as our sort of partner, but also when you train chat GPT, you learn, and then it teaches you it's, it's, you've got this really high IQ partner. And if you do it right, um, it, it will serve you well. Um, so I, I feel like instead of it being this evil sort of robot thing, it's more like your high IQ partner to help teach you and elevate you. I mean, it, it fixes grammar, it fin fixes sentence structure. It, it, it does a lot of things and it knows what a creative brief is. It knows what a strategy is. Now, we know that you have to put the human element in there too. And I think that's what I've come to learn is that it, whether that's a pop culture thing or just sort of opinions or things that you you want to observe and put in there, you've got to have a human brain to to drive it. Or guess what? It's really mediocre. It's like a big bucket of vanilla pudding. It doesn't it doesn't have any any edges to it. So that's actually what I found that I'm teaching is how do you sort of coerce it or manipulate it or tweak it or hack it so that it can be you know, of value. Otherwise, it's just a great race to mediocrity. Yeah. Now, you you shared with me and before we hit the record button and in our previous conversation that you know and have worked closely with Tim Brunel. And, yeah. and Tim is an old friend of mine and, Tim, and a friend of ours because he was on our show some time ago where he shared with us and our viewers a tool that he'd created on ChatGPT called the Creative Brief Coach. And on this tool, he used his growing understanding of the of the the tool itself to train or ask the chappy chi to train itself to create this thing called the creative brief coach and he used the format of get to buy as his template and he walked he walked through for henry and me how this thing works so it was fascinating to me when you shared with me that you and tim are working together so um and it's also fascinating to me that you said that in previous that you, that's in previous classes, you have submitted work to your local, was it the Addies? Yeah, we, we, we participated in the Addies this, this year for the first time in probably four or five years because of COVID, it sort of, you know, put a, a foot on that, but we, we went back at it and I would and say- how many, we, how many, and how many, you, you said you won 33 awards Yeah, uh, uh, and all of them were ads generated or using in one way or another AI, correct? Yeah, it may have been that we used it to generate just the brief or just some lines um, or or the whole the whole nine yards. We had a student that did a, a TV spot that was written uh, based on a strategy and a creative brief and then headlines that were written with chat GPT and then all the imagery done in mid journey and then assembled using um, a couple of other AI tools as well as like Adobe After Effects or whatever. And and all of this was up front. The folk, the judges at at Addie's knew that that was part of your. Was it, was there a case study you had to to submit along yeah, with these? You know, that's a great question. I, so I went to the Addie's, and I was watching. I was sitting with a bunch of the folks uh, that are that are on the committee, and they leaned over and said, "Is this AI?" And I I, I sort of thought it was obvious, but they couldn't tell. And I thought that was a really good. That was sort of a compliment because I don't want it to reek of AI. I, at the beginning of these things, I was like, it's okay. You, you sort of heavy handily, you know, you're heavy handed with your AI. But now I, I'm really trying to teach the class to get away from the, the typical chat GPT isms and the typical AI imagery, which is either very sort of real, but not real, or, you know, trying to be real. I, I'd rather go the opposite direction and I, the thing is, in my class, I, we're studying the classics. I mean, and when I say the classics, I, I think I told you that we're, we're studying like the Altoids campaign from the 1990s, which I, I, you know, that was sort of 
an era of of greatness for for a lot of print and outdoor ads where you could you could you could actually own it. I mean, um, Stefan Poster, who wrote that campaign, you know, he won a ton of Con Gold Lions for that campaign, and and that campaign was just you know for for me it was like gold it was like so like irreverent and ballsy and just you know it was really on the edge but not crossing over into the dark side or or into r rated it was you know it was really on the edge where that's where i'm trying to drive my students I'm, i go you've got to be you, you can't just write a plain headline i'm not going to accept right. that right so what what i wanted to ask you it's setting this all up but i wanted to ask you Russ, is what are some of the things that you've learned because you've only been doing this now for what a year or two correct yeah so what are the things, you know, you bring your background, you you bring your developing understanding of AI, you've tapped into someone like, you know, to Tim, who also br brings a ton of knowledge, and you're bringing this to a classroom full of kids who are hungry to learn how to use this. Yeah. The work that they produced has been entered into an award show and judged by some professionals, whether they know it or not, yeah. who, who acknowledged it as being great work. So what what are some of the takeaways that you can share with us? What are you learning about what this tool can do for us? Is it is it living up to its promise? Is it still got a long ways to go? I mean, there are skeptics out there who are saying, we don't want the Toys R Us campaign that we just saw. That was just awful. That was just like they're bragging about, we used AI. And one of the reviewers, you know, we had Ashley Rutstein, who has a TikTok presence, and she did a review of that spot and said, look, you're bragging about the tool. Yeah. The idea sucked. You yeah, should be that's, bragging that's, about the idea. Yeah, that's exactly it. it. I I tell all my students that we're in the idea business. And so, you know, a mediocre idea is a mediocre idea. There's no, AI is not going to make it better. And in fact, AI is a really great tool for sort of level setting mediocrity. And maybe you've heard this before. It's It's sort of that's what AI is going to do. And I saw a billboard for Grammarly for Business in the city the other day. And it was saying, you know, like something about we can help you write headlines. And I thought, yeah, you can write mediocre headlines because I've, I've seen it. I've played with all these tools and it, it, it tends to be really good at just pumping out mainstream stuff. But we're not we're not trying to be mainstream. We're, and we're not we're not trying to be just provocative to be provocative. We want that sort of you know insight into the brand or the product and bring it to the audience in an interesting engaging way that maybe is is you know something that sort of that made you look kind of thing like oh my god or something that really you go yeah i, I really i like that and that's what i observed with the altoids campaign i also show off some of the oatly oat milk campaign as well which i feel was sort of influenced by the Altoids campaign a decade earlier and or two decades earlier. Um, and there there are other examples that I show in the class of some some really great headline driven ads. And then we move into sort of the art direction phase of advertising in the second half of the class where we study some of the classic things where just an image can sell an idea without even any copy. You can just sign it with a logo. I mean, you know, sometimes, uh, or or just a very sort of subtle tagline, so that the image is doing all the hard work, and 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 you know, powerful, emotional, thought provoking images that that tie back into the strategy, but not in a way that you know, what's the saying? Your your brief is showing. <laughs> you know, like you gotta so, you gotta go further. I think that one of the things that we should have learned about advertising over all of these decades is that the advertising that we all acknowledge as being great is usually an example of the advertiser or the agency that created it zigging when everybody else was zagging, um, you know, really standing out. And, and so as you were talking about, you know, the play between headline and image, I was thinking about, the famous think small print ad for Volkswagen, which ad age, you know, said was the best ad of the century. And the reason that it was um, so jarring was that it did something and nobody else was doing. I mean, it was, 
it used a lot of white space on a page where at the time what everybody else was doing was filling the page with image and copy. They had a lot of white space. They had a very uh, small headline, a very small image. Um, they used uh, sensory fonts, which were never used. They used photography instead of illustration, which was the standard at the time for automobile advertising. So in a way, Anytime you pick up one of these tools and start doing what everybody else is doing, you're kind of setting yourself up to be in the majority. The question is, the, the ads that are going to stand out are going to be the ones that do something different from that. Um, so it, in that sense, and, and it, every time AI comes up on this podcast, you know, until I'm proven wrong, I'm going to believe that this is just the next step after Photoshop, after, um, you know, Illustrator, Cork Express, <laughs> uh, Microsoft Word. Um, you know, these are tools, but this isn't creativity. Creativity is the person who makes the decision ultimately and says, this is the idea. Yeah, Henry, you bring up a really good point that, that uh, I have shared this idea with my students that doing like an ad maybe like let's say apple think different or or something that's that's just huge and culturally like you know goes beyond everything i i said you know that's like the stars have to align to do that like you've got to have the the right client the right creatives the right agency like you know you could show ideas to your your creative director boss and they could kill those ideas and then they never go there and then they never get to the client and they never get produced Clients could see it and go, no, nope, it doesn't work for me, move on. So, you know, there, there's a lot of star alignment that has to happen. What I'm trying to do in my classroom is say, hey, look, I'm, I'm going to play the role of creative director and we're all on the same team. And then when we get kind of to the finish line, I'll kind of put on the client hat and I'll, I'll, I'll try and give you a little bit of harder feedback, a little bit more of a rough treatment, like, hey, this is what it's going to be like. But if it's a good idea, I'll support it and we're going to produce it. And why wouldn't you, like, I had a couple students uh, last year that I said, let's pretend these are Super Bowl spots. So why don't, if you, this is a Super Bowl, Bowl, <laughs> Bowl spot, why don't you put like a David Bowie song in it? Like, let's go for it. And the student did it and it just knocked my socks off. I was so excited and it was AI and it was very primitive and basic at the time. But I, I, I saw that spot again the other day after not seeing it for like a year. And I realized like a year ago in AI time is like a decade in normal time. So it still stands up. And the one thing that that student, student did that was so great was at the end of this sort of visual story with the, with the David Bowie song going, he wrote a really brilliant tagline that popped up on screen, sort of a classic advertising trick, right? You, you sort of set it all up and then you deliver the punch at the end. And it took him about you know, 20 swings of the bat to get to get to that line. I, I rejected, you know, you know, 19 lines before he got to that one. But it was, you know, us getting to that. And he was using chat GPT to help, but he ended up having to write that line himself because it wasn't, it wasn't going to write that line, but it gave him like a parts department, a toolbox, and then he got it. But that's really, I think, where we're at right now is it's a great sketch pad, it's a great toolbox, it's a great organizational tool. And if you're smart enough and human enough to get in there, and if you've got a little bit of, you know, you have some good human emotion that you can go, wow, this really touched me, or I see, I see something in this and I'm gonna bring it out and polish it. I, one of the things I say to the students is, you're looking, it's like you're, a, you're panning for gold and you've got this tin pan full of mud and you've got to go in there with like tweezers and find the little piece of gold because it's at a glance it looks like just a tin full of mud, and, and 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 let's 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 clarify. You have to make a value judgment that that's a piece of gold because someone else could be looking over your shoulder at the same pan and say that's just crap. That's just a piece of mud. So it it really is. And if it's you, Ross, making that decision versus one of your students. Your your conclusion may carry more water, more weight than the students because you've got that experience to know the difference between gold and crap. Yeah, um, I I did that yesterday, and I had three 
professors ghosting my class and they're all industry professionals teaching it, or they're working at big ad agencies and they jumped in and, and watched the class um, much like you're going to do Howard in the, in the near future. And they saw that process where I was harvesting these, these sort of insights out of their, their brief and their mantra and, and then saying, here it is. There's a very succinct sort of statement. And I said, now you're going to go back and rewrite your mantra and title it with that. We, now we have something to say that's, that carries, you know, some emotion and that that's a flag that we can salute. And, and you're going to rewrite, actually, you're going to go back and rewrite your strategy and your brief and your mantra based on the fact that now you've, you've come to a conclusion. You, you've made an observation. Everything else was just very sort of scientific facts and, and sort of very, I, I make a joke that it sounds like an eighth grade science teacher wrote your, your work because it's so buttoned up and it has no emotion. Well, it's interesting because we had John Steele as a guest the other night, as I was telling you all the way from Perth, you may know that he wrote the book, Truth, Lies, and Advertising. And he said in his book, and he reiterated in our conversation, that he doesn't truly have a brief until he's got the finished ad. Which, you know, and Henry Henry's like, yeah, yeah that, that makes perfect sense. Because yeah. once you see that thing that's come out of the brief, then you either acknowledge the brief the way it was, or you fix the brief to make it reflect what this cool idea was. So, yeah. you know, I, I'm I'm sitting here, and I completely agree with what Henry, I, I agree with Henry's skepticism, but I'm also of the, of the opinion, and I said this to you before we hit the record button, I'll, record button, and I'll say it again to, right now, you're out front taking bullets yeah. for the rest of us, and I applaud you for doing that, and whether this becomes something more than just a tool or not doesn't matter, in my opinion. We need to test this. We need to find out what we can do with this tool. And I think you're doing some great stuff. And I look forward to joining your class and listening to what your students are doing because we do need those people looking into that pan and saying, is there gold here? And someone is going to say, no, it's just all mud. And someone's going to say, no, wait a minute, I've got, I've got a piece of gold here. I've used chat GPT myself to write, not to write copy, but I've plugged in copy that I've written just to see, hey, can you make anything better out of this? And it, on in total, it doesn't. But that doesn't mean I can't grab a sentence or a phrase and say, oh, yeah. hey, I hadn't thought about that. Maybe I would have gotten there myself. Maybe not. So it is, in that sense, what Henry is calling a, a valuable tool. Question remains, where does it go from here? So, you know, I think also, so an interesting thing that I'm doing um, and, and why I've gotten really good at using these tools is I, I don't think it's fair to just throw these students sort of off the deep end and help, hope they can swim. So what I do is I do the assignment live in class every week. I do it in front of them. I said, look, I'll, I'll probably be able to get a nice, like in the time frame we have for allotted for the class, I could probably get a B plus on this assignment right here. And your job is to get an A minus or an A by outdoing me. But I'm going to show you how to do the homework. And we record the Zoom of the class. I also give them some sort of cheat notes and tips and tricks, and then off they go and they try and do that. It's it's really interesting because the ones that are doing well are kind of kicking my butt. And then you can see the ones that are sort of just sort of copying me and then the ones that are floundering a little bit. And my job is to pull everybody up to the level so that they're all getting it at least done in a competent way. But the coolest thing, I mean, if you guys, you'll see it, there are a handful of these students that are taking it to another level because, because they're, they're smarter. They're a little more daring, if you will, like they're willing to walk the tightrope and take a chance. But what I, what I am demonstrating to them is not just here's the tool and here's how to make it do this. Here's how to harvest like those nuggets of insights. And here's, here's how to, you know, sort of use this as a tool, not as a, not it's not the be all end all it, it is it is this very high iq machine <laughs> that that can do things but you as the human have to be the one that goes in and pulls it out well let's take a look you said that you're working on a creative brief right now for a class assignment um, and you're using chat gpt to assist you so if you want to share 
we what you what you're where you are now i would i think henry and i would love to see what's going on well you, you're gonna laugh because like you know it takes a little bit of training as you can see oh oh yeah we understand that I lots mean, I, of training lots of training and um as you get through all this you know um you, you it is the sum total of the training so the amount of time you put in you're going to get um better results and one of the things i do is I asked ChatGPT, how does it want to be trained? How does it want me to do it? Yeah. I said, what are the key steps in creating a brand slash product strategy for an ad campaign? So before I even started down this next assignment, I just wanted to test it. And it, you know, I, I told you earlier, Howard, that it knows what a brief is. It knows what a strategy is. That might be just you know, sampling. I, I think it's be, I think it's because it's read both of my books. It probably has. If your book is <laughs> out there, it knows. Um, what would be interesting, though, is, you know, you can you can make a PDF of a book and then you can go down here and upload it and have it ask questions against your book. Uh, uh, yeah, that's the last thing I'm going to do. <laughs> well, so um, but I could I could, you know, I could take your book and do it for you. So anyway, um, but then we'll, we'll, we won't be friends anymore. <laughs> here's the thing. <laughs> it, 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 this is why I say this is a great teaching tool. Because imagine that you've never done this. And now, as a student, you're sitting here going, oh, I've got to define the objectives. Uh, I've got to understand the audience. I've got to analyze the market. I've got to develop the brand positioning. I've got to craft key messages. I've got to select the channels, plan the creative execution, implement and launch, monitor, optimize, evaluate, and report. So, okay, it does all that, which is, again, my eighth grade science teacher could have done this, right? But I wanted to get a really good prompt in here and say, how can we write a successful creative brief for an ad campaign assignment? What role does the brand or product strategy play? Do we need to know the media strategy as well? What's the budget? What are the deliverables? What's the tone, voice, and vibe? Is there a brand guide? Are there fonts, colors, photo styles? What about social, out of home, wild postings, radio, streaming, pre-roll? Is there a data function for A-B testing and additional optimization or refinement to be done? after we review the data and what key ingredient will form the creatives? Is it an observation an insight or a strategic imperative? So that's a big chunk of prompting, which yeah, that's a lot. as you know, I'm kind of cheating, but that's what I want to get out of this. So now it comes back and it gives me the key components of the creative brief, knowing that I want all of those things baked into it. And what was interesting and what I was looking for is is the specificity of you know it, you know where are we running this this creative because you know are these just print ads or are these going to be on pre roll for Hulu and then we get down into here and this is sort of the territory of of your TikToks the sort of insights and observations and a lot of that that you know gets gets a little gets a little fuzzy for some people like what do you mean and um, I asked it to to sort of get more on that. And then it, it knows what we're working on. So we're working on a campaign for the uh, late night Taco Bell menu. That's where we're going on this assignment. Students haven't seen this one yet. It's going to be a brand new assignment. And, you know, it's going deep on messaging and tone and all this stuff. And it's even got a budget put in here, but I don't think that's enough. So I said, can you dig deeper on this and cite actual research? Can you tell the truth about late night eating? Is it drunk college kids looking for some late night munchies? What kind of data do we have? I, I'm now probing and poking at it because I don't think it's, you know, it's it's not really going anywhere. And, and this is what, what I think is a, a, a noted weakness of chat GPT because when it struggles with these things about which it doesn't know as much, it makes shit up. Yeah. So it, it even says right here in the top that it searched five sites and it's going to okay. cite those references for me. But it did a whole thing on key insights on late night eating habits, which this is this is kind of brilliant. Imagine that I'm sharing this with the creative team, and this is the research basically of of what's going on. Like why are well, people let, me, let me just interrupt you and say that uh, a year or so, maybe longer ago, I did a, something like this for some research I was doing in, on another book I'd written, not related to advertising, where I wanted to find the research. I want, tell me what your sources, tell me what the sources are for, for the conclusions that I've drawn. Yeah. And the best they could do it then was, I'm sorry, I can't do that, but I'll give you some 
prompts for for google okay so the world changed since you did yeah that. yeah so this, is, this is if you look up here yeah 4.0 i was about to say yeah there's 3.5 that you were working in there's four and there's four so i'm in 4.0 which can scrape okay. the entire internet and it pulled from a website called better you and an article called college student eating habits mm. it also pulled from healthcare uh something about late night eating um, so it's pulling these articles and I love, I love how you just toggle over and it shows you where it came from. Um, and so now I've got, I, I said this earlier, I think chat GPT is making me smarter because I want This is doing the research that would take me a lot of work and time to compile all this yeah, and make it into this nice, look how organized and, and sort of put together this is. And, and it actually gave me this little summary implications for ad campaigns you know, the appeal to convenience, the social context, health considerations. And then I asked it to use our creative instincts, which I don't know if it knows what that is, but I said, can we make assumptions that are, there are some funny parallels to vampire behavior or other nocturnal animal habits. So that's my human brain making a push here. Yeah, I would call this maybe something along the lines of of uh, creative starters. Yeah. To try well, to I see if the, if the chat will... will you know, make the, make a leap. I just, and this just popped into my head. I'm like, I go, who is out in the middle of the night eating? And I thought about, you know, there's a lot of, you know, coyotes in my neighborhood and there's, and then maybe the funny part would be like, oh, vampires. So I just threw that in here and it, it did something interesting. It said vampires and night owls. I love the night owls. What a, mm -hmm. I, I didn't have that in my head, but now I do. So there's a benefit of this little exercise. And then it's saying that college students, like vampires, come alive at night seeking sustenance in the form of late night snacks. So, you know, I, I feel like, you know, it's helping me voice this thing. I'm, I'm acting as the, you know, the strategist for my classroom, and now I can bring them this. And um, it's doing some mediocre stuff like saying, feed your midnight cravings. Like, okay, I'm not going to let them use that phrase, but it no, is. you know, but you know what this, 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 and Henry, tell me what you think about this. This seems like fodder for a client brief with a, what a client might hand to the agency about what it knows about itself. Yeah. I mean, what I, so I've used chat GPT specifically in a context like this, where I want to get some quick thought starters about the, the area that I'm already thinking in, in terms of that direction. Um, and what I find is that it is useful because it turns stuff around very quickly and it does give you stimulus to react to and it could spark other things. Um, so I, in terms of a client, like, God forbid, like, I, I don't know. I just think that it would be piling more stuff into client briefs that is already there. Um, they tend to be pretty verbose already with their own kind of data and their own view of the world. But it, it I think like all, to, again, going back to my idea that this is a tool, some tools, you know, a Photoshop in the hands of an amateur is not very good. Photoshop in the hands of somebody who knows what they're doing is very powerful. Yeah. Um, AI in the hands of somebody who's fumbling around in the dark is probably not going to yield you very interesting things. AI in the hands of somebody who understands how to query, how to analyze the responses, how to push, like you showed uh, Ross, how to push certain areas and iterate on that until you get something approximating what you were hoping for. I think that's ultimately the key is we have to become expert users of the technology. Yeah. I think the idea that the AI itself will solve all the problems. No, you're going to solve the problem by knowing how to use it. You know, um, Henry, look, look at these taglines. So my point is when I've got this in front of my creatives, I go, you can't use any of these, you know, they're, they're, they're thought starters, but these are not it. Like, I think what happens is a lot of people, and, and this is probably sort of like that Toys R Us ad and some other things we're going to see where they just use whatever pops out of the machine and they go, wow, look, it wrote a brilliant line, fuel your midnight adventures. And I'm saying, no, you can't use that. That's, that's a good starter about things, but you can't just use what pops out of here. You've got to, um, you know, 
you got this is first this is first draft stuff it's yeah, just yeah. absolutely it, first draft we we used to do an exercise called the bad headline olympics where we would just sit with a whiteboard with a whole creative team and write like 30 to 100 really crappy goofy weird lines and get them out of our system and then start on the good ones and maybe we'd go back and harvest a couple of the bad weird ones that we were actually well well that's a pretty good line but but this is sort of where we're at now we're really just doing the bad headline olympics and we're not even writing headlines by the way this is all just sort of the the prep and the and the run-up to get there we haven't tried to write yet and i said give us some observations that we can dig into what are the core behaviors of these night creatures in the wild because i wanted to you know i'm trying to inspire and educate and engage this group of creatives to to feel excited about this assignment and 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 maybe this isn't something that they've done or maybe everybody's done it but they've never really like looked at themselves like oh my god i'm i'm well, when i'm out at night i'm like a nocturnal animal i'm like a raccoon or an owl foraging for food you know that's <laughs> that's kind of funny well ross have you arrived at something that is close to a, a creative brief that you're happy with at this point uh no and i i i i'm glad you asked that this is this is sort of me training myself to get ready for that because here's the thing Howard I'm going to make them all do it so I'm not going to I'm doing this to kind of prep myself and then I've got another thread that I'll start with them from scratch and we'll start training it and doing it in class and then they're going to have to get to here I don't want to give this away yet they're they're going to have to do I kind of keep the curtain a little bit pulled um and unless they watch your podcast they're not going to know the answers but well, this um, won't this won't air for a little while. So we don't, if you're, if you're okay. going to introduce this this week or next week, you're you're cool. I, I I think the thing here though is I'm not trying to hide you know this from them. I want them to have all of these tools at their disposal because I want them to work on being creative. Not right. You know they're not going. I mean, some of them might go on to be strategists, but this is this is pretty cool that it gets it gives you this structure. That's what I really like. So your core. Scroll back down a little bit. The core message, or the other direction. Oh, the core oh. message is that the equivalent of your your proposition. You know, I I think I told you earlier that it's it's a little fuzzy for me. I don't. I, I well, don't... I know this is this is like this is like early this is like early days, and this is yeah. a first draft. But yeah. I'm just wondering, is your core message the equivalent of a single minor proposition or the one key thought or whatever you? That's what it looks like. Because yeah, that's what it does. Yeah. yeah. The observation would be like the insight and then the core yeah. message is yeah. yeah. And like, and here and here and here's the thing. And, and Henry said this before, and and you know, John Steele reiterated it, and, and Sir John Haggerty has said it. The single minded proposition or the core message, whatever you want to call it, doesn't have to be absolutely clever. It doesn't have to be inspiring, although we 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 it aspire. Helps. It it helps yeah, if it, it is. It does. We aspire for inspiration, but as Henry has said many times, and I've reiterated, absolute bare minimum, it's got to be clear. Creatives can work with clear, right? And that line that you had there, could you come back to it, Ross? Yes. That to me is not clever. It's not inspiring, but it's clear. Feed your inner night owl. That's clear. I can work with that, right? And the reason that so many creatives think that creative briefs suck is because we don't even get a clear Right message. It's mumble. It's muddled. It's mumbled. It's it's seventeen things instead of one. This is still one thing. The other thing we talked about with John Steele, which is, and we talked about like the pressure that strategists write in writing a brief to have that killer, um, single minded proposition. And the truth is, a brilliant idea might be might be sparked out of your target description or out of how you describe the insight. Or out of one of the you know considerations that you put in as an additional consideration, so it's it's not the brief in and of itself is like it's not a a, a spear gun spear. It's more of a net, you know. Yeah. Like there there might be, um, uh, uh, it's not necessarily gonna be that sharp pointy object, but it just has to be able to catch those great ideas. Yeah. And, and to, and to even go a little further, 
re repeating a tick, uh, something I said in the TikTok video, which we also talked about with John Steele, and that is John, Sir John Hegarty said that he knows he's got a good brief when he can take that proposition, write it down on a piece of paper, put it above or below a picture of the product, and he puts that on the on the wall above his desk. And he says, "Okay, is is this a good ad? Is it a, is that an ad?" And if he says it's it's decent enough, he said that's the first ad. The brief then becomes the first ad. My job as a creative is to make it better. So I would look at your core message. Scroll down again so I can look at it, Ross. It's like feed your inner owl, your yeah. your inner night owl. Put that above or below a picture of Taco Taco Bell or the logo or something, and I'll put that on the wall and say, okay, is that a good first ad? And I'd say, yeah, that's not bad. I think okay. that's that's a starting point. Uh, that, that's it. So that's how we do it in the classroom. I have uh, a Google slide deck where I have a a, a, a fa like a placeholder headline and and the image of the product, and we're doing it on another brand and product right now. And I make them write, you know, ten headlines to present. They have to um they have to have the strategy, the creative brief, the sort of what I call a mini mantra. We used to call them handles at Deutsch. And and it's a I got them down to 140 words because that's that was the number that somebody told me was a good number of words, and then and then we we write the 10 headlines and we then they present their top three headlines in this sort of audition format, which is really what you're just talking about the the you know put that line next to the product and see if it goes. I, I wanted to show you the other trick that we do because this document is is lengthy and complex. And so what I do is I, I ask um, chat to summarize it into 140 words with five key insights or bullet points. And that's because I want this to be really tight so that it fits nicely on a, on a you know, in the, in the deck at, at that many words and we can just, we can go to it. Now we can always keep that big long one, you know, copy it to a word document and keep it on your desktop, but really, really, really have um, a succinct uh, summary. And sometimes when it does these, I, I said five key insights and bullet points. Uh, we're, I, I don't know if we're just going super slow today, but it usually pounds us out pretty quick. Um, those bullet points are- It knows we're watching. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Sometimes these bullet points are are really, you know, interesting to, to look at. I don't really like what this did in this one. This, it kind of messed it up. It didn't give me what I wanted. So I, I probably just prompted it in a weird way. But that's a nice little campaign summary for like, imagine, again, I'm trying to just get the students' heads to wrap around what the assignment is. And and I instead of just saying, hey, we're making some ads for Taco Bell's late night thing, you know, go do some research. I'm doing the research and I'm and I'm sort of pressure testing the brief or the strategy and some of this research and getting together what I really want them to do. And, you know, it, it's, 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 Ross, it's you're, you're, you're teaching yourself to be a strategist. It's what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And a brief writer, um, you yeah. know, I think that that's, you know, ultimately, you know, AI aside, the, I, creative, and I've always said creatives, don't need strategists and they don't need really good creative briefs to come up with a good idea. What a good strategist and a good creative brief does is that it increases the chances that you're going to get a good idea because exactly. you're, you're somehow focusing the work in a specific area. Somebody has looked at all the research, looked at all the data, extracted all the stuff that doesn't matter um, reduced it down to something you could understand and hopefully something that inspires you. And that will hopefully lead to less time wasted and, and better swings of the bat. Um, uh, can you hit a home run without a, a, a good brief? Yes, of course you can. Can you hit a home run with a good brief? Uh, can you strike out with a good brief? Yes, you <laughs> yeah. can. Of course you can, but the the question here is: there's a reason every major league team has a hitting coach. It's not because big leaguers don't know how to hit; it's because it's those little things that maybe you don't see um, that help that can increase your batting average by ten percentage points. And by the way, ten percentage points probably translates to a million bucks a year in the big leagues, right? So yeah, yeah, 
So, uh, uh, Ross, if you could come out of screen share there, that's yeah. great. I, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, what I think this is, the benefit of this is, from my perspective, and Henry may see it differently, but I want you and I want other educators to be getting our students, whether they go into advertising or not, to start thinking more seriously about this thing called a greater brief, which yeah. will then get them to be thinking more seriously about great advertising. Because right now, you know, the universal response among creatives when you say creative brief is like uh, an eye roll. Mm -hmm. um, and people like me and Henry, we're trying to change that. We want, we want to show you that there are ways to write briefs that are going to have a more, more likely to have a positive influence than not. I mean, I agree with Henry. It's like, yeah, we can do it without a brief, but we want to vastly improve the odds. So what you're I, doing, taking I, the bullets taking the bullets, you know, because you're kind of out the out front, I think is a good thing. And uh, thank you, Ross Patrick, for joining Henry and me on the Brief Brothers. This has been fascinating. I, I feel like I'm I'm working in service of the Brief Brothers on the forefront of AI. So I, I feel like, uh, you know, this is going to be something we're going to have to revisit in maybe a few months and talk again about yes. it. We'll, we'll have, uh, I, I just got a text uh, that's a, about some more AI stuff that I've got to do in the fall. Uh, that, the the tsunami wave of AI, I call it a tsunami wave because it's not a big wave you can see coming and get out of the way of it. It's just kind of coming. And over the last year, it, it's been seeping into more and more things. And, and I'm getting asked to use it, you know, on, on everything and and use the methods that I'm doing because they've seen the results. You know, that, that's great with having a university that has let me do what I do. And then they're saying, Hey, great. This is, this is actually working out great. We're getting a lot of, you know, we're hearing a lot of percolating from industry that this is going to be the big thing in the next year or so. So please keep going and keep doing it and, and grow it. And now the tsunami wave is like, you know, it's, it's really coming up strong. And I feel like really lucky to have been at the forefront of it because I, I, I am not scared of it. And I, I get to do this you see what I'm doing with, with just chat GPT, let alone, you know, we should, you guys got to see the art direction side of this, this equation. When we take the, the brief and we go and we visualize it with, with, with the art director side of our brain, it's really cool. Well, well, we have good reason to bring you back and talk about that in, in greater length. So in the meantime, thank you, Ross. This has been wonderful. Awesome. Good stuff, Henry. Good stuff, Howard. He's Henry Gomez. He's Howard Ibach and together. We're the Brief Brothers. Till next time. Bye-bye.